Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday service. I hope that you've got your cup of coffee or your tea with you this morning, that you've found yourself a nice comfortable spot to watch the service from, perhaps your favorite couch or even in your bed, that's fine. Um, and I just pray that more than anything, though, that you've come this morning hoping and expecting to meet with God and know that as you as you watch this video, you gather together with the rest of our community who are watching this. And so I pray that this service will be a blessing to you. We're going to begin our service by lighting our peace candle as we remind ourselves that Christ's presence, presence is always with us. Lord God, we light this candle to remind ourselves that you are with us even when we walk on the road of despair, even in our confusion when we can't make sense of the things happening around us, you are there. Lord God, we ask that as you reveal yourself to us, that you would give us the eyes to see you and a heart that turns to you and trusts in you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading from Psalm 116, verses 4, 1 to 4 and 12 to 19. Thanksgiving for deliverance from death. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bones. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, um, I'm Carol and I go to the Methodist Church in Franschhoek. And Russell asked us if we wouldn't just say something about what we are missing during this lockdown. And John, my husband, and I have talked about this quite often. And you know we're missing lots of things, but I think the thing that we're missing most, because we are a very close-knit family, we're missing our family and our friends. Because we're retired, we, we actually have a very um, regulated life. And every morning John walks into the village and has his coffee with some of the other folk from the village. He's missing that terribly. And then on a Saturday morning, we join our friends at the market and we all have another coffee at the market. So we're missing that. And then we're missing our church friends and our church family. And of course, I miss the Sunday school terribly because a lot of my week has taken up preparing for that. And all my life, I've been a sort of creative person. So I just love my Sunday school. I love the children. And I love creating things for them to do and to feel closer to God and to know that Jesus is always with us. Um, and Paddy and Jackie, 
we teach Sunday school together, we are going to make a determined effort to try and keep connected to the children. Because everything's very strange at the moment. I mean, having to um, um, go to school online and being involved in this lockdown, we're living in a very strange and uncertain world. The only thing that is certain, of course, is knowing that God is with us and that it must all be part of his great plan. So, I think that's just about all. I've told you what we're missing. And I just wish everyone in our church family all the best blessings. And we look forward to the day when we'll all be together again. Cheers now. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to share with you what I've learned uh, in this time is just to appreciate uh, all the small things. We don't always have time for that. We're always running around and now uh, we're forced to, to slow down a bit. So it's nice to just um, look around and see the mountains and the beauty of God's creation that surrounds us. Uh, spending, of course, spending time with our family is very important and spending time with our friends. Um, so it would be so nice just to go and have a cup of coffee or tea with someone and just to ask them how they are. Also our community at church, my missus, uh, seeing everyone. Uh, you guys must all have a wonderful day further and also a wonderful week. God bless. What has this lockdown done for me? My immediate response was one of frustration. Having just moved house, and being unable to buy the so-called needs that moving house entails was most frustrating. Even when small hardware items one can normally buy seven days a week are now unavailable. Dissatisfaction steps in. I want it now. But as time has moved on, I have realised that none of these things are important. It doesn't matter if the pictures aren't hung. The kitchen rubbish bin is a plastic bag. If shopping and food choices are limited, we make do, we make a plan, we do without. And suddenly, life becomes less complicated. It becomes easier. I have time to think about the important things of my life. My quiet time is more relaxed. I enjoy the sunsets. I wait for the first evening star to appear. I read books. I complete jigsaws. I slow down. I play with my dog. I think about life have time to stop and think about all the suffering in the world. I watch the world coming together on the same front. I don't believe the world will ever be the same again, certainly not in my lifetime. But is this a bad thing? I have memories of my simple, uncomplicated childhood. There was time for life, for love, for God. My hope is that when this lockdown is over, people will have a change of heart and realise that life is precious. God has given us so much to enjoy that is free. Let us unite with love and caring for people of all races, for rich and poor, where people love, not hate, and most importantly, where God is in the forefront of our minds all the time, and we listen to him as he leads us. When every day seems the same, when no one is listening to our dreams, our hopes, our fears, you pause, God our Saviour, turning your head so that you can read our lips, know our concerns. When every road seems the same, filled with despair, littered with pain, you come beside us, Lord, showing us the way to take us to your Father's table. When every step seems to trip us, when every loss weighs us down, when every grief breaks our heart, you come near, Lord, to heal us, showing us the scars of our Saviour, 
bringing us forgiveness and grace. When we feel ignored by everyone, when we are disappointed by everything, you walk with us, Lord. You talk with us and you refuse to abandon us. You point us to the hope of the cross. God in community, holy in one. Hear our prayer. Amen. Over the years, I've really enjoyed discovering new and interesting hobbies to take up. And so at one point, the guy was, one of the guys I was working with was an avid whitewater kayaker. And he was naturally very passionate about what he did and he tried to get me to take up the hobby as well. And so he lent me one of his extra kayaks that he had. And he said, the first thing you've got to learn before you can go on a river in a kayak, you've got to learn to be able to get out of dangerous situations. And the primary way that you do this is by learning to, to do a, a kind of a safety role. So what happens is when you're kayaking, obviously in the rough waters, um, inevitably you're going to go upside down in the boat. And you've got to be able to get yourself back up. You've got to be able to get out of that position. And there's a particular move that you do where you take the paddle and, and once you're under the water, you, you use the paddle and you twist your body at the same time in this beautiful coordinated motion and you flip yourself back upright. And so in order to teach me the skill, we went to a reservoir the one day and he, he showed me the basics and we, we did it a few times so I knew what to do. But he said, I need to practice this. I need to go to a swimming pool or find some body of water where I can practice this in safety before he's going to take me to a, a river. So anyway, um, once again, we were out at, at Midmar Dam and uh, we'd gone out for a brow with some friends. And I took this kayak along with me in the back of the, the Land Rover. And while they were all spending time together um, up on the shore, I went down into the water and I started practicing. Flip the boat over while I'm underwater, do this, this barrel roll technique. Um, but at one point I got a bit tired and, and I'm not particularly, particularly coordinated. And while I was upside down, I, I kind of got halfway where I could just lift my head up out of the water, but the boat's still upside down. And I did it once and I went back down underwater. And second time and I just was out of the water long enough to grab a breath of air and back down. The third time I'm now panicked. I, I realized that I actually can't do this. I'm, I'm too uh, caught up in what I'm doing to realize I can just pull the, the splash cover off and fall out the boat. And so as I go up to grab that breath of air, I just shouted, help, to my friends on the shore. Now for me, this was a desperate cry for help. I was in, in panic, I was fearful, I really thought I was gonna drown. To my friends sitting on the shore, they just see this boat which is sitting upside down in the water, quiet all around and all of a sudden a little splash and a help. Well, I tell you what, um, all these years later, I've never lived that story down. And every time my friends get the opportunity, they, they give me a, a hard time about the time that I cried help from under the water. And so you see this morning, we're going to be taking a look at the first sermon that was ever preached in the Christian community. And the message of that first sermon was a message of asking for help. And so we're going to look a little bit at that this morning. Now this last week, this last Tuesday, President Ramaphosa um, detailed some of the ways in which the government is going to help South Africa from corporations to individuals, going to help South Africa recover from the, the economic disaster which has come as a consequence of our lockdown. Over the last few months, Christians around the world have been asking for help, praying to God, asking that God would, would give us a cure, a vaccine, a way out of the situation that we're in. But when Peter preached that first sermon to the people of Jerusalem, 
the message of help that he preached was slightly different. See, the first message, the first sermon that was ever preached was a sermon, a message of repentance. It was a message of repentance. For Peter, the, the point of primary importance, the, the most important part of his message, is that we need to seek God's help for the situation that we are in. We need to seek God's forgiveness for our sins. For Peter, that was, that was the most important thing he could tell the people as he stood up in front of them to share with them about this person, Jesus. And it's a message that I think we need to, to look at this morning. See, one of the, the key phrases that, that Peter uses in this, this sermon of his, he says, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. See, we need help. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can give it to us. Jesus is the only one that can save us from our sins. For many of us, though, asking for help is not easy. Some of you are, are, are the ones who love to help others. You are the one that cares for and looks after the people in your life, your family, your friends. You're so used to looking after them that, that you don't know how to ask others for help. It's just too unnatural. You're, you're the one that's supposed to be helping. Other people shouldn't be helping you. We become so accustomed to helping others that perhaps we become unable to ask for help ourselves. For some of us, though, we may feel that admitting that we need help just shows weakness. It shows vulnerability, and, and we've been brought up to hide that, that part of ourselves. We've been taught that you don't show weakness, you don't show vulnerability. And so to admit our weakness, and our failings, is embarrassing for us. It's, it feels so unnatural to, to go to others for help because it's, it's showing them a part of ourselves which we often keep very private, very close to our hearts. For some of us though, the reason we don't like to ask for help is that we're too proud. We're too proud to admit that we might need help from other people. We see asking for help as an admission that we're incapable or deficient or lacking in some way. You know, that perhaps there's, there's a part of us which isn't good enough. And, and so we don't want to ask for help. We don't, we're too proud to let people see that we don't have all the answers. We don't have it all together. And so many of us, what we do instead is we pretend that we've got it all together. We've got everything under, under control and that we don't need help. Even when the, there are times that we're desperately in need of the help. See, my cry for help from uh, under that kayak has lived on as a moment of embarrassment for me. Um, every time I hear that story, I just have to smile and, and take the punches. But the truth is, if I had sat under the water worried about what my friends would think of me for asking for help, I might still be under the water. If I had been too proud, too arrogant to acknowledge that I was actually in trouble, the consequences in that situation would have been so much worse. It could have been a, 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 it would have been not just a funny story, but perhaps a tragic one. And sadly, that is the story that so many people choose to live with. They choose the tragic story of never getting the help that they need, never getting the salvation they need from Christ, because we're, they're either too arrogant or too proud too unable to show vulnerability, to admit that actually they are in need of God saving. This morning's message is a message about asking for help. It's a message of, about admitting that we haven't got our sin under control and that we need help from outside of ourselves. It's a message of asking for help. Today's message is a message of seeking God's help for salvation, when you and I are drowning in the waters of sin. And now for many of you, you you're Christ followers and you've asked Christ to save you from your sin. 
But this is still a message for us today. Because there are still things, there are areas of our lives that we, we continue to struggle with our sin. There are areas of our lives where sin has not been completely defeated. And we need Christ to continually save us from our sin. We also continually need to be asking God to give us the, the vitality, the energy, the ability to follow him in the places that he calls us, in the ways that we're, we're called to follow him in our faith and in the world. And so repentance, Peter says repent, it has two parts to it. And the first is what we've been speaking about, it's admitting that we need help, admitting that we are sinful. We have to admit that we don't have it all together, that we have failed to love God, we have failed to love others. Admitting it requires being brutally honest with ourselves about who we really are. See, we often, we often forget those parts of ourselves which are unsavory, which are ugly, which really we try and hide until we can no longer hide. And so admitting our faults and our failings, admitting our sinfulness is never easy, but it is necessary. Because we cannot receive God's help. We cannot receive his salvation if we don't ask him for it, if we don't admit that we need it. But there's a second part to repentance. See, the second part of repentance is that we admit we need God's help, but then we turn around. With God's help, we turn around. We no longer continue in the direction that we were going. We don't ask for God's help and then continue in the same direction. We ask for God's help and then we turn around. The second reading that we have for today is the story of the two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus. And they're talking about things that have just happened in Jerusalem. And as they're going along, a man joins them and starts joining the conversation, starts helping them understand from their, their own scriptures the significance of the things that have happened, why they needed to happen the way they did. Until it, at last Jesus reveals that it is in fact him who has been traveling with them the whole time. Now this story is not a story of repentance. But it does have some parallels to the, the message of Peter's sermon. And so the, these two disciples who are walking on the way to Emmaus, they're walking in despair. They're, they're walking in hopelessness. In, in, in re reality, they're lost. We don't know why they're going to Emmaus, but there's no reason for it. What, what scholars have suggested is that they're afraid of what's going to happen. Jesus, their leader, has been killed. Who's to say that they're not next? And so they're, they're getting away from the center of trouble. And while they're talking to Jesus, they share these very insightful words. They say to him that we had hoped that this would be the Messiah. We had hoped. Aren't those words that so many of us utter? We had hoped. We had hoped that the lockdown would be over by now. We had hoped are words that express our regret over the situations in our lives that haven't turned out the way we hoped they would. They're words of disappointment. They're words of hopelessness. They're also the words we might say, or we might think when we've really messed things up, when we've got ourselves into a situation out of which we don't know how to get where we've broken someone's trust, we've destroyed a relationship, we don't know what to do, and we, we think to ourselves, I had hoped that this would work out very differently. It's an admission that actually we don't have it all together. They're the words that we might think when we've lost all control of a situation and we no longer know what to do. We had hoped. See, the disciples had pinned their own hopes on Jesus. And he had failed to deliver what they wanted. It is when they admitted how futile their hopes had been. It's when they say, we had hoped. It's admitting that what they hoped for did not happen. It's at that point that Jesus is able 
to explain everything to them, to show them how Christ had needed to die in order to redeem Israel and the world as well. There's a small detail of the story that I, I love so much. And like I said, the disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking in the wrong direction, as it were. And, and I find it so, so incredibly powerful that Jesus doesn't say to them, friends, why are you walking this way? You know, you, you've got it wrong. Let me set you straight. Jesus just walks the journey with them. He doesn't ever point out how they're wrong or anything like that. What he does is he slowly reveals the truth about who he is. Until at last their eyes are open and they see the truth right before them. And when they see the truth, when they've had that encounter with Jesus, they turn around. They go immediately back to Jerusalem, to the, the place they've just left, the city they've been trying to get away from. The situation they've left behind them, they turn around and go back. An encounter with Jesus changes the direction that they're going. It's, it's what happens to us when we repent. The direction of our lives changes. See, Jesus is, is far more interested in revealing the truth about himself to us than pointing out how wrong we are. As much as we need Christ, as much as, as we need to acknowledge that, that we've got it wrong, Jesus doesn't come to us and point out those things. He, he simply shows us who he is. And in that encounter, when we realize the truth about who Christ is, we then see ourselves in comparison. And we recognize our need for Christ, our need to turn to him and then be turned around by him. At the end of Peter's sermon, he says this phrase, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. If you think about it, it's a slightly ironic saying, or slightly ironic thought. He's saying to them, save yourselves. Repent and be baptized, but save yourselves. And, and see, what Peter's really getting at here is that Jesus has done all that is required for you and I to be saved. He's done it. There is nothing that we need to do or can do to be saved. But the ball is in our court as to whether or not we will accept his salvation for ourselves or not. We have been given the choice. And so we save ourselves by turning to God. The way that we save ourselves is by admitting that we cannot save ourselves. We save ourselves by asking God to save us. Do you notice how the disciples, if you read the passage, which I hope you have, how the disciples invite Jesus to share a meal with them? As they're walking along, they see Jesus is perhaps continuing on, and they say to the stranger, come share a meal with us. They're hosting him. They're opening their home to him. They invite Jesus to their meal. But what they don't realize, and what we see happening, is that once the invitation is given, Jesus becomes the one who is sharing his meal with them. And it's just such a beautiful analogy of what happens when we ask God to save us. We do that one small thing. We invite Jesus in. And then he, he offers his salvation to us. He hosts us at the table of his grace and shares the truth of his salvation with us. And again, we see that unless Jesus had been invited into their home, he wouldn't have forced his way in. The invitation had to be given to him. Jesus doesn't force his way into our lives. Sometimes our conscience works hard at, at showing us our need for Christ. But he will never force his way in. The choice is yours. It was my choice to accept Christ or not. You have to make that choice as well. You have to choose to ask God to lead you every single day. Jesus doesn't force himself upon us. He offers us his salvation. 
He offers us his companionship, but he doesn't force his way on us. We must decide if we will save ourselves by asking Jesus to save us. So perhaps in the current context, that means we need to admit that our efforts to create a just society where God is honored is simply not possible on our own strength. We just see it every day as we, we realize the effects of this lockdown and the economic, the health effects of the coronavirus. We just see how our attempts to create a society that is good, that is just, that honors God has failed. And we need to repent, to turn around, to admit that we can't do it. And we need Jesus to do it for us. It means that we need to admit that we are not able to save ourselves from our own sinfulness, from our personal sin that we commit. But we need to ask Christ for his salvation for that as well. It means admitting that we need God's Spirit to guide our daily lives as we learn to live as Christ followers every day. The two disciples walking to Emmaus invited Jesus to dine with them, and in doing so, Jesus became the host to them. That's what happens when we invite Christ into our lives. We, we invite him in thinking that we're going to host him in our hearts. And instead, he invites us to share in the meal of this grace as he brings his salvation to our lives. So this morning, I pray that if, if there is an area of your life that you need to repent, that you need to admit you have failed God, that you have sinned, then turn to God. Turn to Christ. His salvation is free to all. I pray that you would know the blessing of his Holy Spirit as Jesus reveals the truth about himself to you each and every day as you walk with him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I really hope that you enjoyed sharing this service together. If you would like to continue in a time of worship, I've put together two playlists that you can click on at the end of this video.